uh, my postdoc and I last uh, year published a paper in Nature Human Behavior where we uh, found a link between number one and number three. People usually think that first you fix the numbers of women. You get more women into a discipline, and then you can introduce sex and gender analysis. But the reverse may also be true. Uh, and it's very important for policymakers. Our findings demonstrate an empirical link between increasing the numbers of women in academic medicine and enhancing excellence in research by incorporating sex and gender analysis. So my short talk today will focus on this third strategic approach, fixing the knowledge. It's the newest area and the most important for the future of science, engineering, and innovation. And this is what Gendered Innovations is all about. So let's dive in. Doing research wrong costs lives and money. For example, 10 drugs were withdrawn from the US market because of life-threatening health effects, and eight of those posed greater threats for women. Not only did these drugs cost billions of dollars to develop, but when they fail, they cause human death and suffering. We can't afford to get the research wrong. But doing research right can save lives and money. And I like these kinds of metrics. This is uh, an economic analysis of the Women's Health Initiative, which was a large US government uh, NIH project done in the 1990s, which found uh, they were looking to see whether or not women should take hormone supplements after menopause. And uh, it was so clear that, they, that women shouldn't that they stopped the trial in midstream because it was becoming dangerous to take these supplements. So this study found that for every dollar spent in the research, 140 were returned to taxpayers in healthcare savings, and it also saved lives. As you can see, there were fewer cases of cardiovascular disease, fewer breast cancers, and more quality adjusted life years. And of course, the downside of not having as much estrogen is that there are more osteoporotic fractures. So it's crucially important to get the research right from the very beginning. And this is the goal of the Gendered Innovations Project. This project does two things. First, we develop state-of-the-art methods of sex and gender analysis. And secondly, we provide case studies or concrete examples of how gender analysis leads to discovery and innovation. And in, in this talk, I'm not going to look at the methods, but I want to share some of the case studies with you. But first, to make sure that we're all on the same page, I offer to you this lovely uh, illustration from Vera, Vera Regetza Grosik, who works in what they call on the continent gender medicine um, in Berlin. And as we know, sex is, are the biological components of a human being. And these interact with gender or the social attitudes and behaviors that shape people's experience. Here she's emphasizing nutrition and lifestyle, but you might think of education or ethnicity or any number of factors. And these interact over the course of a lifetime to produce health outcomes in adults. So we are made up of both our sex and our gender. Then I want to emphasize that we talk about male and female. And in this talk, I'll mostly talk about men and women. But we need to see that the population is also composed of intersex people. And I'm giving extra credit for those of you who can tell me what the eight countries are that allow doctors to check intersex rather than male or female on the birth certificate? Not the US. I think India was. The first. I think India was. Yes, India. More comers. Germany. Germany, yes, but only for three months. And then you have to make a decision, right? So it's not like you can have it on your passport or something. Um, others are Nepal. Malta, New Zealand, where's Australia? Mm. And Pakistan, Bangladesh. Oh no, Australia as well. I didn't know. I mean, I didn't remember. OK. So now uh, we, you see that we don't have really good statistics on this, because 
this data isn't collected. This is something we could let, collect and know. And then um, we also have, this is for the US, uh, we have around 2 million transgender people, and we don't know how many people are gender fluid. It's not, it's not data that is collected, but it would be very interesting to know. So let's go back to why 10 drugs were withdrawn from the US market. There are many reasons why drugs fail, and fail more often for women. And one reason is that most research is done in males, whether in animals, uh, humans, or cells and tissues. So this study was done in 2011 by some of our colleagues at Berkeley, and it shows the sex of the animal that is used in biomedical research, so in preclinical research. And the blue here clearly indicates that male animals are more often used, except in the areas of reproduction and immunology. But what I'm interested in here is this gray area where the sex of the animal is not even recorded. This is research money wasted. You might as well throw it out the window. You need to know the sex of the subject so that you can properly understand the biological conditions. Then uh, in 2011, this type of study was also done at the Mayo Clinic with cells and tissues. And here you see only gray area. And this, again, is research money wasted. So perhaps you're thinking, OK, that was 2011. What about now? This is the most recent data I have. Um, and you can see this shows the percent of studies that consider sex as a biological variable. And it's just completely flat. Now in 2016, the NIH, US National Institutes of Health, implemented a policy that all public funded research must look at sex as a biological variable. So we expect a spike. We would think that there will be a spike coming. Um, and the Canadian Institutes of Health also have this uh, requirement. And the EC has this requirement as well. So I would think that the figures will be going up very soon. So now let's go to the website. I want to go to our Gendered Innovations website. And I'm going to do a first case study, and I want to talk about stem cell research. And I mean, as you see our website here, this is a public uh, resource. Anybody can use it. We built it to work as fast in India as it does in Silicon Valley. Um, and we have here our methods that are loaded up. These are the kinds of questions that researchers can ask when they're designing a project so that they get the right uh, sex and gender analysis into the project. Terms, we have some checklists. And then these are our case studies in buckets of science, health and medicine, engineering, and environment. So I'm going to start with stem cell research. Why might the sex of the cell be relevant? Research shows that there are sex differences in the therapeutic capacity of stem cells. This slide shows stem cells taken from muscle tissue and indicates that female cells are more regenerative or active than male cells. Yet very few researchers consider the sex of the cell, which can lead to failed research. An international team from Norway and Australia worked with some stem cells in mice. And they appropriately used male and female mice in the study. So they get a good grade on that part of their research design. But they used all female stem cells. And this was an unconscious and arbitrary decision. It means that in the discovery phase, they did not see anything unique to the male stem cells, nor did they detect important differences in function between male and female cells. The result of not considering the sex of the stem cell was that their male mice died, and they didn't know why. They thought maybe a postdoc made a mistake. When in doubt, let's blame the postdoc. But eventually, through a gendered innovations workshop in Norway, they realized that they should consider the sex of the stem cell. And they found in their project that what worked best was male to male and female to female. But of course, you have to take into consideration all the possibilities before uh, ruling any out. And then, of course, it's not that easy. Uh, we have a method which is 
analyzing factors intersecting with sex and gender. So one has to take into consideration any number of other factors. In the case of the stem cells, these factors may include cell type, the disease being treated, and other variables, hormonal, immunological, and environmental. So let me just interject here. Sex matching, which may be important for uh, stem cell work, may also be important for organ transplant. So I hope you never need a heart transplant, but you should look at the science if you do. For hearts, it seems that male to male, and for kidneys, male to male, lungs don't follow that pattern. But even when the surgeon may know the best science of the sex involved, then there's a gender issue in the US, anyway, I don't know about the UK, women donate more organs. So even if the surgeon knows the best science, the surgeon may not be able to implement because of gender relations in society. So there's much more that we can say about biomedical research. Uh, we have a number of case studies, but I want to turn now to engineering and talk specifically about machine learning. And I will talk about natural language processing and focus on machine translation. And I start with a little story. So some years ago, I was in Madrid, and I was interviewed by some Spanish newspapers. And I don't happen to read Spanish, so when I got home, I zoomed the articles through Google Translate. And I was shocked that I was referred to as he. Londa Schiebinger, he says, he thought, and occasionally it wrote. Google Translate has a male default. So how can such a cool company as Google make such a fundamental error? And this is where it gets interesting and where you need the interdisciplinary research. Google Translate defaults to the masculine pronoun because he said is more commonly found on the web than she said. This is another Google tool. It's Ngram. You can't get through your day without a number of Google tools. But what it shows here is the ratio of he said to she said. It was 4 to 1 and peaked in 1968 at 4 to 1 and then fell dramatically to 2 to 1 by 2010. And so what else happened in this period from 68 to 2010 in society? Right? We had the women's movement. We had um, our National Science Foundation invested a lot of money in recruiting women into science and engineering. It was a, all of our TV uh, news people use inclusive language, he and she. It was a huge cultural revolution. And with one algorithm, Google wiped out 40 years of cultural change, and they didn't mean to. It was completely unconscious gender bias. So the fix, a couple of years ago, the Gendered Innovations Project held a workshop, and we invited natural language processing experts from Google and from Stanford. They listened for about 20 minutes, and they got it. And they said, oh, we can fix that. And it was such a cool problem. They were like emailing under the table. Cool problem, cool problem. So fixing is great, but constantly retrofitting for women is not the best road forward. I had to ask myself, how did those Google engineers, many of whom are educated at Stanford, how did they get out of my university without a basic understanding of gender issues? The problem is that at Stanford, you can come over to history of science and take all kinds of cool classes on gender. But we are not where the engineers live. We are, gender issues are not incorporated into the engineering curriculum or the computer science curriculum. And so we're working on that now to get the basic understanding of sex and gender difference into in the school of engineering. So again, products can be fixed. But what if Google, Apple, and other companies started product development research by incorporating gender analysis? What innovative new technologies, softwares, and systems could be conceived? So the point I want to make is that this unconscious gender bias from the past amplifies gender inequality in the future. When trained on historical data, as Google Translate is, the system inherits bias. 
And it turns out that even though Google wanted to fix the problem, they've been una unable to. It's sometimes harder to fix something once a basic platform is set. And importantly, Google Translate is creating the future. Our technology, our devices, our programs, and processes shape human attitudes, behaviors, and cultures. In other words, past bias is perpetuated into the future even when governments, universities, and companies themselves, <coughs> like Google, have policies to foster gender equality. So the big question is how can humans intervene in automated processes to create the society we want? There are now many examples like this one from Google Translate, and I'll just give you a few more of these examples. So if you use Google Search, Men are five times more likely than women to be offered ads for high paying executive jobs. These are jobs over $200,000 in the US. The mach machine understands that women earn less than men and that perpetuates the cycle. Word embedding, this is a really interesting one from machine learning. Word embeddings capture associations between words that risk perpetuating harmful stereotypes. So if you look at words in vector space, you see that there's a close association between man and computer programmer and woman and homemaker. So we want to break up that kind of stereotype. In the legal system, this is very serious. Software used by US courts was like, twice as likely to flag white, uh, black as opposed to white defendants as being at higher risk for committing future crimes. So the issue is here, the judge, the courts are overloaded in the US. OK, that's your first problem. But the judge has to decide whether the person in front of him or her is going to get out on bail or be kept. They're too dangerous. They should be kept in prison. Um, and the algorithms, so they use algorithms to speed up the process. And the algorithms uh, don't get it right. Then in image search, I quite like this example. Stereotypes about men's and women's occupations are often exaggerated in image search results. A search for nurse results, the word nurse, results in disproportionately low numbers of male nurses compared to their actual representation in the field. In the US, that's about 10%. So you search the word nurse, and you get women, women, women. And the men who are in that profession don't see themselves reflected. The opposite is true for CEOs. So you search for CEO, you get men, 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 and not the women, the percent of women in the field. And now here, I think um, we have an interesting question. If you want to fix this, do you have the search results return to you 10% of the nurses who are men? Or do you want to be aspirational and have, 50, have equal representation in the images, hoping that you can recruit more men into nursing? I think it's an open question and interesting to discuss. So these kinds, there are lots of solutions to these problems. And I have to say the computer science community is on this. It's important to address these kinds of issues with interdisciplinary teams of computer scientists, lawyers, political scientists, historians, gender experts. Um, and the goal is to optimize algorithms that guarantee fairness. So next week, Thursday and Friday, we're having a workshop at Stanford where we are identifying the problems, where exactly in machine learning does bias reside, whether in the input, the output, the predictive models, or the algorithms. We, importantly, we want to map the solutions. And we want to discuss who should be involved in the decision making to fix these problems. Is it going to be the computer scientists themselves, in which case we need to change the education? It needs to include more social issues, more ethical issues. Should it be teams of ethicists? Sometimes this is too late. Or maybe it should be government oversight committees. Now let's shift gears from uh, machine learning to robotics. And we held a workshop uh, in January on gender and robotics. So again, these workshops are like with roboticists and then with gender experts, people who have not worked together before. And 
We had several questions. We wanted to know, why do people feel the need to attribute gender to robots? After all, they're machines. Is gender domain specific? Is a woman's voice ideal for dating advice and a man's voice ideal for tutoring, math tutoring? Uh, what genders a robot? Is it the appearance, the voice, the mannerisms, the movements, the demeanor? Then we were interested in gender and emotional intelligence. Uh, one of our experts is in haptics. We wanted to know what is a, the appropriate social touch between robots and humans. I had no idea we humans had so many rules about touching each other, but we're going to touch the robots the same way. I mean, it, it's really kind of interesting. And research shows that humans often harass robots, and might this behavior influence relationship between humans? So how do we design <coughs> socially responsible robots? So um, robots are designed in a world alive with gender norms and gender identities. And so let me start again. So robots are designed in a world alive with gender norms, gender identities, and gender relations. And humans, whether as designers or users of the robots, tend to gender machines because in Western culture, gender is a primary social category. And robot designers and specialists in robot-human interaction argue that this tendency of humans to project human social cues, including gender, onto artificial intelligence may in fact help users engage more effectively with robots. That's debated, whether we should gender the robots to make them more effective with people or not. But if we do, there's a danger. As soon as users assign gender to a machine, the stereotypes follow. Similarly to what I was talking about in machine learning, the danger of gendering robots is that it may reinforce gender inequalities by hardening current stereotypes. Designing hardware toward current stereotypes may amplify those stereotypes into the future. In other words, if we design a, a robot now with our gender stereotypes from 2018, we'll be relieve, reliving 2018 for the next 50 years. The, so the challenge for designers is to understand how gender becomes embodied in robots, to think about that question, and to design robots that promote, or at least do not harm, social equality. So let's take this first one. Let's understand what gender's a robot. So here's Pepper. Pepper is, um, I think Pepper's a Japanese robot or a French robot now owned by the Japanese. I can't quite, no, 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 that's now. I think this is a Japanese robot. So there are several things that we want to look at. What does the color say to you? Researchers have shown that just a few gender cues lead people to assign gender to a robot. One research group found that a man's black hat or pink earmuffs were enough for users to perceive a robot as male or female. And interestingly, when no cues are presented, users tend to perceive the robot as male. Western culture has this masculine default. So the voice is another thing that genders the robot very quickly. Pitch of a voice indicates whether it is male or female or a child. Lower voices carry more authority in Western culture. For example, Ma Margaret Thatcher, your first a uh, woman prime minister was trained by a vocal coach from the National Theater to lower her voice and to make it more authoritative. So the choice of a voice for the robot may be domain specific. Users in one exper experiment were more accepting of a male voice in a security role and a female robot in a healthcare role. So you can immediately see how this reinforces stereotypes. Now, Pepper's voice is childish, and people try to get around this gender thing by having childish voices. They're non-threatening. A lot of these robots, this one is used more for um, entertainment and for malls and that sort of thing, but many of them are for health care or for elderly care, and a child's voice is not threatening. So they try to um, use something like that. Now, the name Pepper is a nicely non-gendered name. 
The designers call him a he, but I think Pepper is basically, of course, in one of the movies, Iron Man, Pepper is the female assistant. But for us in America, Pepper doesn't have much of a gendered name. Then an anatomy. I find Pepper's anatomy confusing. In the absence of hair, the head looks sort of boyish, but the cinched waist and the skirt-like legs seem feminine to me. Then we want to look at personality or character, as the designers call it. I haven't studied Pepper's personality, so let's take Siri, the voice on your iPhone. Siri um, was designed to be slightly sassy and demure. These are the words of the designer. They wanted a sassy assistant. And Siri, like the other female virtual assistants, are often harassed. So Apple records everything that is said to Siri. I had no idea, but they do. So Siri gets many proposals for marriage, which we didn't know about. But Siri is also often harassed. And it's important that, um, so the designer, so Siri has a number of responses. I sometimes, as a party game, ask Siri, why are you a woman? And you get three or four responses out of Siri, right? They're like programmed responses. She says, I was not assigned a gender, meaning it's my fault I'm assigning her a gender, not Apple's fault that she has a gender. But anyway, we want to make sure that how humans become uh, used to interacting with machines, that this doesn't spill over into human behavior. So if we are harassing robots or uh, these virtual voices, we want to make sure that, so her responses have been changed to uh, rebut the harassment a bit. So the designers have done something there. So now back to Pepper. Here's one of the kickers. Social critics have pointed out that most of these robots are white, that you will see. And they find that the many, many blue eyes are problematic from an ethnic point of view. So it would be very easy to choose. Uh, Pepper's eyes uh, differ whether it's listening. It changes its eye color to indicate to the user that it's listening or not. Um, but we could easily have chosen colors from outside the human palette. So let's look at a couple more robots. Here's NASA's superhero, Valkyrie Rescue Robot. So NASA claims that Valkyrie uh, is completely gender neutral. That's the US policy that sh Valkyrie should be gender neutral. Sorry, I almost said she. Um, but most humans will interpret the robot's uh, unmistakable breasts as female. And, but nonetheless, the broad muscular shoulders and uh, the visual representation seem decidedly male to me, but I read the backstory of Valkyrie, and the designer, because he had a seven-year-old daughter, wanted to challenge gender stereotypes and create a superhero who was female. So this is supposed to look female. Now, NASA gives you a long story about why there are breasts, because there's a battery pack, and poor Valkyrie can't balance without having more weight on the front. But did they have to give her cleavage, is what I want to know. OK, so I'm happy. Uh, so you'll be happy. I was very happy to find these robots uh, because they're customized around ethnicity, uh, different skin tones. And Milo was designed for learners with autism spectrum disorder. Now, Milo only comes in the male variety. And of course, more males suffer from autism. Females are underdiagnosed, but perhaps it's reasonable that this is a male robot. Uh, but I do think we would then need something for the millions of girls who are off also suffering from uh, autism. So let me, well, I do have more to say, but I'm sort of running short on time. Um, so what we want to do is know if we can design robots that promote social equality. There are six options I think we can take. We can challenge current gender stereotypes with our robots. We can design customizable robots where users could pick or choose features. We could design genderless robots. We could design gender fluid robots. I haven't found any examples of those. We can step out of human social relationships and just uh, a lot of assistive robots are animals, little seals and teddy bears and things. Or we can design robot specific identities that bypass social stereotypes. So the important thing here is that we create a virtuous circle. So robotics 
can be a catalyst for changing gender norms, or at least not reinforcing stereotypes. So we have culture here, which is full of gender norms, and the designers have the opportunity to challenge those norms. So the robot can embody gender norms that promote uh, equality. This will influence how children think, how people in society think, and we will come back and can eventually change our gender norms. I think that's the goal. So um, I think I'll cut down. I wanted to say a few things about uh, policy. So maybe I'll just skip through the rest of this um, robot stuff. OK, so let's conclude with a quick look at policy and what Imperial College uh, can do. Um, and I would like to know here in the audience how many of you evaluate grants for granting agencies? Ah, that's a lot of people. So granting agencies can, let me get over here. This is an important step. Granting agencies can ask applicants to explain how sex and gender analysis is relevant in their proposed research. I consider the European uh, Commission the global leader in this aspect with their Horizon 2020 asking for sex and gender analysis in proposed research. As I said earlier, the US NIH introduced sex analysis in 2016, and I don't see any policies for the UK Research Council. I don't know if I missed those. Um, and I think influential imperial faculty should ensure that sex and gender are designed into research in the UK and that this becomes an important part of the UK research funding requirements. Now the next step, how many people here review for peer-reviewed journals? So again, a lot of people. So importantly, editorial boards of peer-reviewed journals can require sophisticated sex and gender analysis when selecting papers for publication. And Simone and I were at Nature yesterday, was that just yesterday? Yesterday, and uh, Nature is, going, is looking at doing an overarching policy for all of its journals to ask for sex and gender analysis. So your students should be ready for that if they want to publish in uh, places like the, uh, the Nature. So the Lancet um, put in place these policies in, what, 2016, I think it was. Now, to support research, it, it's important for universities to integrate sex and knowledge and uh, analysis into the curriculum. And here's where Imperial will shine, I think. You have Simone, who's working on curriculum. Um, I'm aware that many departments here hold the silver awards from the Athena Swan. And I think you can go a step further by integrating sex and gender into the research, not just into the team building and that sort of thing. And I think we will, I think Athena Swan will be moving toward this as well in their certification process. And then finally, industry. Products and systems that incorporate the smartest aspects of gender can open new markets. Products that meet the needs of complex and diverse user groups enhance global competitiveness and sustainability. So there is much work to be done. Researchers need to learn sophisticated methods of sex and gender analysis. Universities need to incorporate these methods into the curriculum. And corporations need to integrate these insights into product design. But eyes have been opened. We cannot return to a world that ignores gender. Innovation is what makes the world tick. And as I hope I've begun to show, gendered innovation sparks creativity by offering new perspectives, posing new questions, and opening new areas for research. Can we afford to ignore such opportunities? Thank you very much. Well, that was wonderful. We have 15 minutes for questions and discussion with the audience. So hopefully there are people who want to grab that opportunity. There's a microphone in the back. So who can I? Let me just say, I, we have a, a listserv, gendered innovation listserv. If you want to receive updates on current research, um, 
you can sign up, and I, only I send out something, and only about once a month. So it's not a lot, but sometimes it has interesting and things. How can I hope people sign up. Shall I ask? Send uh, me an email, or like phone. Yeah, so email, or, they oh, can. You can go directly okay. to the Gendered Innovations website, and under Contact Us, you can sign up, or you can send me an email. Stephen, you're holding the microphone. Please go ahead um, and introduce <coughs> yourself before you ask the question. Please. Uh, my name is Stephen Curry. I'm Assistant Provost for Equality, Diversity, and I don't Inclusion. think your mic is on. Yeah, now oh, it's it is on. Okay. okay. Uh, Stephen Curry, Assistant Provost for Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion. I was interested in your remarks about uh, the role of Google and, and the design of robots in challenging societal stereotypes around gender. I mean, if one was to play... And ethnicity. And, and ethnicity. And many other yes, aspects. Yes, indeed. But if one were to play devil's advocate, you know, the function of Google is to search the internet and to tell you what the world is thinking. And, and so the biases that it reflects is a reflection of reality. If one is to try and use that technology to challenge stereotypes, how do you construct a system whereby, uh, or you know, which determines who gets to decide what the norm should be or what the target should be in terms of the way that that is pres presented? There are already enough concerns about the invasion of Google and Facebook, these gigantic tech companies into many um, streams <coughs> of society. So like what, our what sort of, what sort of governance yeah. uh, can be put in place to determine what the norm should be? Okay, so the issue is that if we don't do anything, we, so doing nothing is a decision, right? That's a decision. It reinforces the status quo. Um, and Google isn't neutral in what it's doing. As I tried to explain, if you do nothing and allow the algorithm to return to you these past biases, it actually amplifies inequality in the future. So it, Google Translate is now, I am an active woman, an intellectual woman, but I'm being translated as he. So it's adding he's to the web, to the web and it's going to reinforce the notion that intellectuals are he's. So by doing nothing, we are allowing many things to happen, right? So that's a decision right there. So to say that we have to take a decision, we're already making a decision. And I think that places like Google and uh, that a number of machine learning people are only becoming aware of this. And as I said, they're on it. They're very open to it. Uh, the people coming to this machine learning workshop are, you know, technologists and also social scientists and the like. Uh, so I think that we need to take active decisions about these things and not just be passive in the face of this. So you're already making a decision by just letting it run and we now need to actively intervene and decide. We are humans. We are making this technology, and we need to decide what we want and what kind of societies we want. And I mean, you know, the whole Facebook thing in our elections, that's really very serious. And can I ask a counter question? If we would allow black defendants to not be out on bail just because there's a problem in the algorithm that we may want to not intervene with? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you're not proposing that because you were a devil's advocate. But if you just allow <laughs> the system to be the system, we're really seriously disadvantaging people. Uh, I mean, that's a good point. And you're absolutely right that not doing anything is, is also a it's decision. It's a decision. But it's a very easy decision to make but because it just it's happens not by default. <laughs> the, the question was more about what is the mechanism to implement a system of governments that achieves the desirable end? You know, and I don't... The, Yes. And I don't know if there's a, an answer to it. I don't think there's an answer right now. Our NSF in computer science has, they do algorithm audits. Um, the, when we had President Obama, the Office of Science and Technology did several reports on algorithms and the social context and consequences. Um, and <coughs> then at this workshop, there, there's another group that works for fairness and transparency in algorithms, and some of those people are coming. So I don't know. I will be asking my workshop participants if we have those kind of solutions now, but I think we need to be working with policymakers to decide 
how, how we will make these decisions. Hi, my name is Alexa Siegel, and I am doing my PhD here in health economics. I'm also the founder of Queries, and I will be in the Innovate contest on Tuesday, if you saw the back of this, um, which I'm really excited about. Um, my question is about gender fluidity and how we're moving towards more of that kind of ambiguous gender and sexuality and all of that. Um, so for example, the Google images where you said, you know, you can do 50-50 representation or you can do how a representation of how it actually is in the field. So when we're moving towards gender fluidity and things like this, how do you decide which to pick? And then how do you think <laughs> sexual orientation will uh, play a role in the future in all of this? Right. So what's interesting to me um, <clears throat> with this new scholarship on the, bi on the gender bias in algorithms is that you can only, to find this bias, you use men's and women's names and you can't get transgender names. This is a problem I'm putting to my computer scientist friends on next Thursday. Um, even by doing this scholarship to show the bias in the algorithms, we're reinforcing that gender is just men and women because we can't, that's how we can identify the names. That's how you can see it. So I'm interested in, in what new tools can we develop so that we can get a more nuanced sense of what's going on in society in the first place. Um, so I think, uh, so lots is going on uh, with transgender and gender fluidity. These are, I mean, these are values that I would be advocating as we make these, you know, as we make these decisions about how we should move forward. Hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to push a little bit Could more. You introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. Yeah, my name is Malcolm Edwards, and I'm the director of strategic planning here. Um, I wanted to push a little bit more on as we're going down the queer theory angle, and I wonder if I could take you on an imaginative journey across to Berkeley and ask you whether, actually, if gender is performative and if our identities are performative, and you can tell I did a queer theory PhD in the 90s, so excuse this all sounding a bit dated. Um, actually, aren't the, robots an, aren't the robots a wonderful opportunity to actually test uh, human acceptance of uh, performance and gender fluidity and, and, and change in performance. Because whilst in some ways robots are much more constrained than we are in terms of the fluidity of their performances, in other ways, not having a psychology perhaps, you know, their, their, their performances can be more fluid. And in fact, is, isn't one of the things you could do with a robot to have it um, adjust its gender performance depending on the, uh, on the way in which it's being received. And I think that would be actually a really interesting I'm, I'm sure I'm sure Professor Butler wouldn't accept that her <laughs> theories could be could be uh, empirically tested but actually it would be a really interesting experiment well I was one of the slides I skipped was to actually recommend that Stanford and Imperial do some kind of human robot interaction experiment around gender equality you could do it around gender fluidity we are all fluid, right? I mean, I have to adopt masculine behaviors in my profession, um, and I hope I'm adopting softer behaviors at home, though I think my family would not think so necessarily. But um, yeah, so the robots should be adjusting their behavior according to the person. That's, that's one of the goals of emotional intelligence. Um, I don't think we're very far with that yet. Um, but I was realizing, I was looking into the question of emotional intelligence, and I was realizing that the robot, roboticists are teaching us how to reduce our emotions to one or two cues, right? So I, I went to Berkeley, actually it's a Berkeley website, and I did an emotional test to see if I can read emotions in people. And I was getting some wrong, and I consider myself quite good at reading emotions. And then they would ex explain to you why it was wrong. But then I realized it was a shape of a, you know, the shape of an eyebrow, the, a particular shape of the mouth. So at the same time that roboticists are trying to uh, develop emotion in the robots, so emo emotional communication in the robots, 
the, the feedback loop is teaching us humans, in a sense, to reduce emotion. And th this is so then I want to say whose emotion, right? So I'm concerned about keeping the uh, variety of gender experience we have and loosening that up so people can express whatever they want to express. And I think as AI and the robots come, we have to really think about these issues as we design these things so that we keep the kind of human flexibility which allows for cultural change, which is what I as a historian study. And so uh, you know, we want to be able to achieve equality eventually. There are two questions there in the back. Oh, Bianca has one. Yep. You already hold the microphone. Do you want to Hi, um, I'm Bianca Wilson. I'm a postdoc in Simone's office. Um, so my question was about, you said that we, you look, historically people have looked at, first of all, recruitment, then culture change, and now knowledge. But my question is, if the same people are programming the robots and the same people are doing the workshops, then surely they're going to do that in their own identity. So if you don't change the recruitment, so you have more people of color and more women actually in the positions, how can you change who decides what you should put into developing the robot? So in terms of your wheel about culture, what cultural norms are, in what circumstance, depends on who's doing it, and what people see as acceptable, is often influenced by your ethnicity and your background as well. And I just wasn't sure how you think about, actually, yeah. if we have the same people, how do we change that? Well, so I don't want to let the majority off the hook. I think that analyzing gender is something that people can learn, which is why we developed 12 methods to guide people in that work. Yes, you want diversity in the design team as well, but we have to break the cycle somewhere. And so we need all designers and all researchers to consider gender analysis, sex analysis, ethnic analysis, uh, so that we can make a change. It shouldn't just be that I, as the woman in the room, am responsible for the gender stuff. And you know, this would not be the right thing. So we need inclusion in the teams, and we need inclusion in the knowledge. And it doesn't, they aren't linked right, to biology. So it is linked to social experience, but you know, we have to break the cycle. And I think we do it by teaching students, by integrating all of this stuff into the curriculum. There's a question, Laura, just in front of you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Mark Kennedy, and I run a lab here that does a lot of research on the future of organizations. And we have a data set where we have observations of about 100,000 employees of a large company. And we, we looked at kind of gendered paths to promotion in there. So this is me as a white male doing, doing that. Um, so I agree with what you were just saying. But what was really interesting to me, and this gets to the point that you were making earlier, is kind of about the difference between description and advocacy in science. So a lot of what we do, we have this notion that we're just going to tell you what is. And that's sort of you know, what's kind of a problem with some of what you're observing about Google. Um, we found that there actually wasn't a lot of discrimination in terms of promotion and pay in this company um, at, at most of the places in their hierarchy. But at a few key places, there were big differences. And those were in spite of a lot of work that the company was doing to try to right the wrongs that were there. So then it came to, well, you have to kind of get outside of that context. And we're, we are trying to describe that in order to try to also do advocacy at the same time. And there, it seems to me like there's a balance between how do you use description, but then flag that what you're doing is trying also with that to advocate for some kind of change. How do you, in your guidelines and in the work that you look across, sort of balance this, like science is just description versus no, you can do advocacy as well? Well, I don't know if you've got three hours. I'm a historian of science. Science is never description, <laughs> right? So, um, so uh, we, I think we had an interesting discussion at Nature yesterday about uh, panels for conferences. So surely you want some women on those panels. You want some uh, representation of uh, underrepresented minorities and that sort of thing. So do you use the percent? So for your, is it descriptive? Do you use the percent of PhDs prepared in that area? Or do you try to balance the panel? I mean, we're making these kinds of decisions all the time. How do you want to foster equality? So I think. 
I think we're, say, if you take physics, we're well aware of what percent women are physicists, right? And so that's information, that's data, that's empirically known. So we can know that. But then I think when we're uh, doing classes and when we're doing panels, I think we can be more aspirational. We can attempt to encourage more equality. That, that's how I approach these things. There's another question there. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's, uh, my name's Jan Peters, and I've been doing some work oh, recently. Oh, hi, Jan Peters. Hi. Um, <laughs> looking at how you can make the engineering uh, curriculum and embedding inclusion within it, so looking at um, both um, the policies and practice within the department that you need to do, but also how you can teach it. And one of the things that's been flagged up um, in the conversations we've been having while we've been exploring this at the number of different universities, but not at Imperial, um, was the, the, the response from en undergraduate engineers um, when they're presented with social science research, and this is undergraduates and postgraduates. The response, what's it? When, so you, you when you show them or give them some social science research to use as a sort of stimulus for innovation, um, as evidence for designs and, and so forth. Um, and they tend to unpick uh, or pick holes in the research and the methodology, <laughs> and they'll do everything they possibly can to devalue it, rather than seeing it as something that's valuable and can help them to think differently about problems and designs. And I wondered if, in your thinking, I and mean, there will be um, a follow-on. We had, had a symposium two years ago over at UCL, and there'll be a follow-on at the Royal Academy on the 9th and 10th of July. Um, so if I can pass the information on to you, I will. So I wonder if, in your conversations with your colleagues at Stanford, whether you've had any, um, you've got any ideas or success in terms of engaging undergraduate engineers in accessing, tolerating social science? Well, I don't know about undergraduate. So I work with scientists um, and engineers in many different contexts. And I find that the social scientists also have to meet them halfway. I wouldn't just hand research to an engineer and say, oh, this can help you. I mean, I, I wouldn't presume, right? So it's a process of dialogue. And in these workshops we have, there's a process of um, exchange and common language that has to be fostered. And there always has to be a common goal. If you don't have a common goal, no one wants to collaborate. So you have to find the common mission and then uh, people, people will find a way to work together. As Simone said, it takes more time, it may take more resources, but it's really productive in the end. So one can't presume, I would never you know, hand them something and say, oh, have a look at this. Um, first of all, I have to find out what they're interested in, what are they doing, what have they looked at. What, my collaborator, for this machine learning workshop, I was asking him the other day, why do you write so well? I mean, you're a computer scientist and a, you do biomedical data analysis. It turns out he was secretly a math major and an English major as an undergraduate. So he has huge bandwidth for understanding all this stuff. And we've now done, in one year, done two papers together. And you know, it's a very uh, full, endeavor because I have the historical aspect to add and he's got all the technical stuff to add. And then we have, our, we have a linguist as well and another computer scientist. So it, it's the process, I think. I think there's time for one more burning question there in the back. Uh, Osip Kolindovich. Uh, I'm a theoretical physicist and I was a bit uh, how can I say? Um, I would change your uh, statement as opposed to gender equality. I would call it human equality and in innovation. Because if, if you take the, the world, 50% roughly is male, 50% is female. And you've mentioned about minorities and everything else. You have left out a very large group which seem to be always ignored. They come in both female and male, and they are the disabled. 
20% of the world is disabled, and yet they seem to be excluded. I'm not excluding anyone. Yes. Thank you for your comment. Any other last comments? I would like to thank you very much on behalf of everybody who's been here. Let's give Professor Schiebinger another round of applause. said earlier, this is certainly not going to be the last time that we're interacting. Um, there's a lot of opportunity both in the research and in the curriculum. We are a research intensive university and um, Nick Jennings and I will be working with you and your Stanford colleagues. Actually one of Imperial staff is coming to your workshop next week and we'll try and work with Stanford on all the important um, tools that we need to integrate into our thinking and I think that together we can really make a, a huge change. We can, we can help one another but uh, you're clearly much more experienced than we are. So thank you very much. I have a small present for you that I'd like to hand you. There you go, you don't need to unwrap it. Okay. From the Victoria and Albert. Oh, it's thank a bit you. more posh than our, our gift shop. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks very much. There are drinks outside, so people who want to ask mm -hmm. questions to uh, Lola mm -hmm. in one-to-one, -one, they can do it during the drinks reception. We have at least half an hour or so to, uh, to do that. So thank you very much. <laughs>